So we're kind of like volunteer firefighters, except with Google products. Wow, it's fantastic to be here, and we're not on fire, so that's a bonus. My name is Alex, this is Hiran. Uh, you can find us on the popular Google Plus network. <laughs> As Jonathan, Jonathan said, we are developer experts, from, uh, and that means we are part of a global network of developers, designers, and product people. Uh, we're selected by Google to share our time and expertise with fellow developers and startups. We're both based in Cape Town. I focus on the Android side of things while here and is a cloud expert. We're gonna share our story today with you about building an Android app, finding out how to get 10,000 active users, and then plugging in a backend. This wasn't enough of a challenge for us, so we decided to see how we could do that at zero cost. So as I said, I'm an Android developer. Some people call me crazy and fanatical about it. It's partially true, but there are reasons for that. It's a really personal platform. There aren't many developers that can say that they spend their entire day, in a way, with their users, in their hands and by their sides. And when they go to bed, I'm right there with them. <laughs> it's a little bit creepy, but it's really fascinating. And I'm sure you all know how much Android has been growing the last few years, but it, it's worth touching on this point. Especially in emerging markets, over the last two years, it's grown substantially. 2004 in particular has seen a massive increase in Africa from roughly 20% of the market share to almost 60%. And that's of a market that is growing exponentially. It's difficult to actually imagine just how many active Android users are out there right now. If you release an app today, by tomorrow morning you could potentially have a billion active users. So back to the My City Cape Town Android app. It started as a side project, or more as an experiment, really. If you're not from Cape Town, you may not be familiar, but my city is our new public transport system uh, with modern buses. It's generally quite a great service. I commute with it daily, um, but there were two things missing from my life at this point. The first was the inevitable question, when the bus is late, where is it? But a far more technical interest to me was the question of how much credit do I have on my my city card? And that's where this project was born. So when I finally got my Nexus device, it came with an NFC chip, and I could scan every card I came across. And I noticed how much unencrypted plain text information was available on these cards, and that really piqued my curiosity. <laughs> but it wasn't just the scanner, the hardware, that changed things for me. It was the software. Uh, my device was running KitKat, which is the first version of Android to introduce host card emulation mode. Host card emulation mode effectively lets your device act as an NFC chip. I could be the card. And this is where the fun started. It turns out a little bit of reverse engineering can go a long way. The NFC communication is based on the open EMV standard. There's a 600 page tech spec you can read and master it. Obviously, I didn't go that route. I, I hacked away through sleepless nights, figuring out things, learning more from each bus trip, and sleepless nights decoding binary blobs of data. After much hackery and convincing a number of security guards and bus drivers that I was doing important research for the university, <laughs> yeah, it's now possible to take your My City card and your smartphone tap them together and get your current balance in points and money, your recent transactions, and your trip history. At this point, I had a pretty cool party trick. I could go up to people and scan their cards and they would be amazed. But that wasn't quite enough for me. Because I was using the buses, I needed more information to use them efficiently. I started adding features like a timetable, 
and then a map, and a bunch of other things, including real-time service alerts. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but we're now in the fifth week of a driver strike for the My City buses. It's been interesting. And these real-time service alerts are what we're going to concentrate and come back to in a little while. I actually couldn't help myself. Uh, I kept adding new things and making it better and better. And Google has recently expanded onto a number of different platforms, including Android Wear for wearable devices, smartwatches. And asking where the bus is is a perfect use case for this platform. I would say, OK, Google, where's my bus? It would pop up and say which it would find your closest and favorite stops. You then select which route you want, and it tells you exactly when the bus will be there, all without whipping your phone out from your pocket. I love that. So as I was getting on and wanting to publish it in the Play Store because friends were nagging me for it, I came across the Africa Android Challenge, which is a, a competition to find the best apps and app developers in Africa. Unfortunately, I found it two weeks before the submission deadline, and the guidelines for judging it made it very specific that you had to offer the best user experience possible and support tablets nicely. So there was a lot of work to do, but uh, more sleepless nights, and I finished with hours to spare before the submission deadline. Submitted it to the competition and published it on the Play Store at the same time. I had no expectations, really. I didn't market it in any way, but people started downloading it, and I built it and they came. The feedback was fantastic and the ratings were high. And it turns out on the Play Store, a high rating is the number one metric for attracting more users. So organic growth led to the first 3,500 users, at which point people from the Google Play platform team noticed it and offered to feature it in the Play Store if I improved the user experience even more, especially on tablets again. So it was finally uh, featured in the Play Store at the beginning of December last year for a week. The growth grew fantastically in that week, or in the next two months following that week, we got 10,000 more downloads. And by the end of those two months, we were up to 9,000 active users already. The growth has continued at the same rate since it was featured, even though it's no longer featured. One of the best things about being featured is it gives you prominent display in the Play Store. The app jumped up to number two in the free transport category, behind only Uber. <laughs> As a side project, I had no intention of monetizing this. Although our numbers might not be as impressive as others, what is quite interesting about our story is how we've managed to avoid all costs. And we pass that on directly to our users uh, with an ad-free interface providing the most uncluttered experience we can. So my idea was to have a zero cost per user scaling model where everything was done on the device or using free external services. As long as the services kept running and I could find time to maintain the app, it would scale forever. It didn't. The real-time service alerts feature scrapes information from Twitter. And so at the time, each client was contacting the Twitter API and retrieving new tweets. That worked perfectly at first. <laughs> so then, uh, obviously, Twitter rate limits their APIs. Uh, so check for a rate limit exception, and then back off gracefully. Worked well for the first few hundred users, not the next 10,000. At this point, we're having up to 20,000 rate limit exceeds per day. This effectively made it a useless feature. You'd get an important update about how the bus is 10 minutes late, but you'll get it four days later. <laughs> it was time to build a back end. I was very reluctant to do this. I have a bunch of other side projects eating away at my bank balance every month. So I looked at the options that were available. I was familiar with EC2. I'd usually whip up an instance 
uh, build an app in Node.js, hold the data in Redis, and serve with Nginx. I've had great success with that before. But I wanted to learn something new, because it turns out when I had a look at the stack again, everything had changed. New tech changes fast. So it was time to learn something new. Uh, I prefer the path of least resistance. And in the Android Studio IDE, they had integrated a new button, which let you click it and generate app engine endpoints, integrate it into your project, and magically just work. It was the blue pill, and I took it. <laughs> it solved everything for me, just about. So it turns out the cloud platform is powerful, but can be very mysterious. My concerns were cost and vendor lock-in. I couldn't figure out for the life of me how much it would cost me if I'd stay in the free quota or not. It was a mystery. So that's when I contacted Hiran. I'd heard him give a few talks about the Google Cloud, and he clearly knew a lot more about it than me. So I'm going to hand over to him to tell you more about how we use the platform. Thank you, Alex. So I got on board the project to help Alex uh, optimize, do some optimization on the back end as well as add some new cloud side interesting features and in general just make the, the back end work a bit better for us. So one of the reasons Alex went with App Engine, which is a platform as a service instead of Compute Engine, which is the infrastructure as a service, or these days Container Engine, which is the container as a service, was that App Engine allowed us to start out with no costs, firstly. And secondly, it was really quick to get up and running. So even though the learning curve for starting out with the platform might seem steep initially, especially for developers coming fresh onto the platform, I felt that Alex had done a pretty good job starting out with it. And after coming to grips with the pieces of the platform, we are both currently quite enjoying working with it. And so began our journey to do some optimization, add some features, and do some load testing of this backend. Some of the very early benefits we got from the platform at the outset was the daily free quota. So we were able to get the backend up and serving requests without even needing a credit card, which was great. The current 10,000 active users for the service also runs off the free quota. Still great. The setup process was really simple. So to get the backend running, all we had to do was create a project in the Google Developers Console, download the SDK, and we were now ready to start putting pieces of the backend together and deploying it out to serve. We didn't have to worry about maintenance or getting alerted about low disk space. We didn't have to worry about scrambling to put the latest security patches onto the platform. We didn't have to worry about uh, how many instances we needed to run, or load balancing configuration, or what we wanted to load balance on. And we felt that we felt that not having to worry about, uh, not having to be alerted about these things, and not having to tweak these things as the user base grew was quite a good experience. And App Engine supported Java. So the client side was done with Java, and this allowed us to keep the language the same on both the client and server side. But it also allowed us to do a, some uh, code reuse uh, on both ends of both pieces of the, of the solution. So an initial concern we had around this was, are we locked in? And I can see how this might be a concern for any developer coming into a platform as a service offering. So we did some digging around and research into the platform, and we came to the conclusion that we were fine. We weren't being locked into this platform. If we needed to move the backend off this platform at a later stage, we could do so for the following reasons. App Engine was a Google product, and we felt that in general, Google culture is not one based around lock-in. There's a project called the Data Liberation Front, whose aim is to allow users to get their data out of Google products. This project was started inside of Google and is being supported by the company. We could easily export our persistent data out of the platform if we needed to. 
So we made use of the data store, which is the storage layer offered by the platform. And we came across libraries, both Google and third party provided, which would allow us to easily traverse all the data we kept in the platform and generate exported formats such as CSV or JSON. The App Engine runtime supports language uh, specifications as far as possible. So in our case, using Java, for example, App Engine supported the Java servlet specifications, as well as the JDO and JPA specifications, amongst others. What this meant for us is that if we later wanted to move this back into a different framework, which also supported these specifications, parts of the code that we've done around these would not need to change at all. And Google sponsors and contributes to an open source project called AppScale. And this project is based around allowing people to run App Engine uh, apps unmodified on a different infrastructure or cloud. So with our worries resolved, we decided uh, to go with this platform. And what were the core components that this platform is composed of? Firstly, App Engine, which is doing the HTTP request serving for us. The data store, which we're using to store uh, our persistent data, storage layer. And cloud endpoints, which was a really special developer blue pill, which Alex seemed to like a lot, around um, helping us do client server communication easily. So what was so special about endpoints? It allowed us to do uh, method annotations uh, on the server side. And with the simple annotation of the method, the platform would expose that method as an API for clients to consume. But it went even further. The platform generates libraries that you can use on the client side to make easy use of uh, the API. And it does so for Android, iOS, as well as JavaScript. We use the Java libraries in our case. So essentially, the platform was taking care of serializing and deserializing all the data in our API calls for us, which was quite nice. We didn't have to worry about any on-the-wire formats or parsing of the data in between the calls. And we didn't even have to worry about the efficiency about how all this happens, because Endpoints uses Google's Protobus under the hood, which is a popular solution uh, in the space for speed and efficiency. Cloud endpoints also gave us uh, a bit of security baked in, being an HTTPS only service. But it also allows you to do easy authentication with, with OAuth, again by uh, just, a, just a few config changes in the annotations on the server side and using the libraries generated on the client side. And then endpoints gave us another interesting feature uh, API versioning. So what this will allow us to do for future features is add on to the API as well as make backward compatibility breaking changes to the API, but deploy, these, deploy this as a separate endpoint version and have different versions of the endpoint serving at the same time. So what this meant is we could easily roll out new changes to the API, roll out the clients and have users use this immediately but also in doing so without breaking uh, all the clients. The data store is the storage layer of the platform which we used. And firstly, this gave us free cloud storage in the form of the free quota that comes with this. But we also had some other benefits from this. We had a highly scalable storage layer uh, of the data store. This was because the data store is based off a NoSQL Google Big Table storage um, facility. And one of the main features of this is that uh, it allows you to have a constant query time over your data, no matter how large your data uh, grew. To access the data store, we used a Google provided library called Objectify. It, we found it to be quite a simple layer to a NoSQL um, storage facility. But we also had a baked-in benefit from this library in that 
it allowed us to use Memcache, which uh, is a platform feature, very easily. So this greatly simplified our caching story for the back end as well. So for those familiar with queuing frameworks such as RabbitMQ, task queues will be really familiar for you. It allowed us to run uh, background tasks in a queue, but more so, it allows you to configure the queue in terms of the execution rate, how many tasks you need to run per second or per minute, etc., and also the retry limit on failed tasks, amongst other settings. These were the two that we used the most. So we use task queues in a few places, the most notable being to reduce the latency of API calls by moving long-running operations into background jobs. And the task queues came with another benefit in that it allowed us to structure the app a little easier as well. We could now move pieces of the app into a central container in a task and wherever we needed to do, wherever we needed to call upon the function in the task, we could do so centrally and easily. An example of this was GCM registrations, uh, which is something we moved into a task and used easily. Cron, so this is your popular Cron uh, offering, allowing you to run scheduled jobs in the cloud. And we use this for two main features, scraping service alerts from Twitter on a schedule, as well as scraping the bus timetables uh, periodically as well. So AppStats was really helpful to us as well. This is offered uh, by the platform out the box. Um, so what AppStats or CloudTrace allowed us to do is dig into the life of an HTTP request. We could then see whether the request was using memcache or not. We could see what other service calls the request was using, and in general see how long this request was taking. This allowed us to find API requests that were firstly taking too long for what we were comfortable with, uh, put in memcache for the ones that weren't using memcache. Uh, as a result of that, reduce the service, the data store read write service calls that these uh, requests were making, and as a result, reduce the overall time that the requests were taking. So this was a very handy tool for us in optimizing those pieces. So with all those pieces in place, what does the current architecture of the backend look like? We have App Engine serving uh, the HTTP requests via endpoints uh, coming from the devices. We have the data store where we are storing the persistent uh, cloud uh, GCM registration information. We have the cron service, which kicks off tasks in the task queue and these are periodically fetching the service alerts from the Twitter account, as well as scraping the bus timetables from the MyCity website. So with the backend in place and ready to scale, we were looking at how we were going to do the service alerts pieces, and I'll hand over to Alex to talk a bit about that. So back to the original problem. How do we send out real-time messages to 10,000 users? We had the devices, they had installed the apps. We had our back end, it was serving data. But how do we actually solve that problem of sending it all out and keep costs extremely low? Enter Google Cloud Messaging. It's designed specifically for this purpose, sending notifications, push notifications to Android devices. How it works is basically when a new version of an app is installed on a device, it calls to the GCM server and asks for a registration ID. This registration ID uniquely identifies that version of the app on that device. Once the device receives the registration ID, it passes it up to the, the app engine backend where we store it for later use. So when we're ready to send out one of these service alerts, we compose the message and we can send that through to the GCM service with one API call. The GCM service then does the heavy lifting of sending it out to all of the devices. And it comes with a bunch of features built in which make this really easy to use. First of all, it queues messages that can't be delivered immediately and retries them. It provides delivery reports, so you can make sure that users get vital information when they need it. 
And sorry. ultimately, this is one of the most important parts of our backend infrastructure. This is the part that let us do what we needed to do at zero cost. So now that we've built things on the front end and the back end, how do we deploy it to all of our active users without burning down the world? On the Android side, through the Play Store console, there's the option to invite users to alpha and beta groups. You can then push out new features and experimental things to these select users, get initial feedback, and make sure it doesn't blow up. It's extremely useful. But my favorite part is doing a staged rollout to production, where you select what portion of your user base gets a new update. And you can slowly increase that as you're more and more confident, and you can fix bugs as you find them. The cloud backend implementation was in alpha for three months, beta for a week, and staged rollout for another week. It was that last week which was the most exciting. Our alpha and beta groups comprise of a little under 100 users, so we could find big problems and change the architecture quite easily. But once we started rolling it out to all the users, I very quickly learned about data store indexes, task queues, and using memcache. <laughs> On the cloud side, with App Engine, you can deploy multiple versions at the same time and have them running concurrently. So we could deploy a new, app, a new version with new features and test that out. We can also split the traffic between the versions that are available. So we could say 10% go to the new feature and make sure it doesn't fall over. And we can increase that to do a similar stage rollout. You can also use it for A-B testing, which is great. So now that we've built it and deployed it, does it scale? So the first question we asked is, does it need to scale? And we considered the following points. From the recent stats uh, based on the user journeys from my city, we could, we could be looking at a user base of between 30 and 70,000 at present. There are also 2.7 million tourists coming into Cape Town each year. And for every 1% of those that decided to use the bus and get the app, we may have an additional 27,000 users on the service. So we decided the backend did need to at least support a lot more users than it currently does. So we did some load testing. We used a load testing tool from the official Google App Engine documentation, and we ran the load testing off a Compute Engine virtual machine. And what we quickly found was the virtual machine CPU maxed out, and it quickly became the bottleneck of the entire load test. While this was happening, the two or three instance counts uh, that we were used to seeing on the App Engine side had ballooned up to about 40 instances. But it was doing so and handling the request, serving no error responses, which was a good thing. So we ended up serving 2,000 requests per second for 30 minutes continuously, even though such a long period of high requests isn't likely given the nature of the service. What this meant for us is that we could potentially serve up to 120,000 users a minute or 600,000 users in five minutes, which we thought was very reasonable for a real-time bus service. So with the back end ready to scale, and we, with, the results, we, with the results that we were happy with, we were looking at other features we wanted to put into the back end uh, to help the service scale more. So one of the features we looked at was filtering service alerts. We send out service alerts to users over Google Cloud Messaging, which interrupts the user on device directly. We therefore had to manually filter some of the alerts coming from the Twitter feed, because not all the Twitter, feeds, uh, uh, Twitter feed messages were relevant uh, to interrupt the user upon. We also had potentially increasing sources of alerts uh, at a later stage. This filtering might take longer as more alerts come in. 
So we looked around to see if we could find something to help us out with this. And we came across Google Predictions API. And what this offered us was a predictions model whereby we could feed the API some text and it would categorize the text for us. These categories are user defined and in our case they would be, this is an important alert or not. The prediction model also allowed us to train it in bulk but more so we could train it on a continuous basis using streamed training, which is interesting. So to put in this feature, uh, we basically had the cron service fetching the new alerts, kicking off tasks to the prediction API, the prediction API determining whether this was important or not for us, and then we were surfacing this on a admin backend uh, for easy viewing. But because we knew we could keep training this model as we went, we had buttons in the back end to allow the administrator to manually um, select whether a service was, was in fact useful or not. And as a result, we could train this model further and further. The, aim, the, aim res, the, the end result of this uh, feature, we thought, would be getting alerts via possibly multiple sources, sending it off to the prediction API, having the prediction API uh, accurately determine which alerts are important to send out over GCM, and then send these out without any human intervention. So the next feature we looked at was scraping the bus timetables. We were scraping the bus timetables off the MyCity website, and in the early days of this service, Alex was doing this off his desktop or laptop. This worked great in the early days when there were a few users. But what about if Alex goes off on a three-week vacation and the bus timetable happened to change? Uh, this might leave thousands of users with an inaccurate timetable, which would not be an ideal situation. So we started moving pieces of this to the cloud as well. The cron piece of the App Engine stack seemed like a pretty suitable job for this. And our aim for this feature would be to have the cloud periodically look for timetable changes for us, but only notify us when the timetable had changed and allow us to easily deploy a new timetable off to user devices. This was a very welcome new feature, because obviously I had been away for three weeks and the bus timetables changed. I didn't have my laptop with me, just my smartphone and a 2G internet connection. Luckily, I had a VM back home. I SSH'd into it, pulled down all the build tools, pulled down the source code, got the new timetables, built it, downloaded the APK, waited a day and a half, uploaded it to the Play Store, waited another day and a half, and then could finally release the new timetables. So this will be a godsend. But of course, most of the features we're implementing on the back end is to facilitate front end changes and new features. These days, we all tend to have multiple devices, and it's becoming necessary to provide a consistent experience between those different devices for the same app. If I scan my card on my phone and go home, I expect to see the new balance on my tablet. So by using cloud storage, we can provide that consistent experience by securely storing their data and syncing it to all of their devices. We could also potentially analyze anonymized trip data and get some valuable insights into how the MyCity service is being used. GCM also provides two-way message sending. This means that clients can send messages to the back end as well. So we could potentially crowdsource all types of information, such as service disruptions, late buses, potentially even gather real-time location on each bus. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many things we can do now that we have a powerful, intelligent backend in place. But not everything scales so nicely. <laughs> I tend to get quite a few colorful emails from people that use the app. Most of them are about late buses and rude drivers. Uh, the distinction between my app and the service is not very clear to all. But some people do ask questions about the app, and a common one I get is, why haven't I put NFC on their device? 
I guess I'm just that kind of guy. And then the other one is they figure out NFC is a physical thing on their device, but they don't have it. So why can't they add their card manually? Snapscan can do it. There's slight technical differences there between the cards. So now that we've deployed it, people are using it, did we actually learn anything from this? On the cloud side of things, most definitely. I think understanding the tools and the different pieces of the platform is really important and is really crucial to make the most of these pieces and, and use them in the right way. Not using them in the right way could easily lead to an inefficient app. And an important piece was the data store. The data store is a very different type of storage. And we, we came to realize that we need to understand how it works and use it in the right way. More so because using it in the wrong way could lead to an app that's expensive in terms of requests, but also inefficient. We also learned that using Memcache can greatly help in terms of cost and uh, efficiency, especially when put in front of the data store and used together with your storage. But did we learn anything on the Android side? Indeed, we did. Before we even implemented the cloud backend, it became obvious that you could develop an app and serve it out to thousands of users and have a successful implementation. It's far less complex to build just a front end than a back end initially. We also learned that you can use external services to a limited degree, especially for getting started. It's a great way of doing things, calling services directly from the client, although dangerous. But the most important lesson I took away from this is making sure that we leverage the great tools that are already out there, especially sending messages on GCM. That was the most important part of this. And also with a little bit of cloud backend, we can actually implement fantastic new features and improve the user experience in the app. So where to from here for the My City Cape Town app? Well, looking forward, cost seems inevitable. What if we expand beyond Cape Town? Right now, we can probably handle all the My City users with our current architecture for the next few years. But what about Joburg and Cape Town? They have similar bus systems. What about outside of South Africa? We can handle that too. The problem comes in when we introduce new features that require extra things on the cloud side that we have to pay for. So the question comes, can this be a side project forever? Does it need to grow up? Well, hopefully we'll find some of those answers along the way to the moon. That's definitely our intention. We want to grow it and make it even better constantly. But how are we going to get there? Maybe with a little help from our friends. My city has an amazing amount of really useful information. Unfortunately, none of it is public and we can't use it. Yeah. So I've explored public transport systems around the world. And for example, in the Netherlands, there's an open data API which provides the real-time location of every single bus, tram, and train in the entire country. This has resulted in a competitive app ecosystem where there are multiple apps trying to provide the best experience possible for the users. This is a win-win-win situation. The transport providers get apps built for them. The app developers get the best data to use. The users get the best apps to use. Everybody wins. The city has recently introduced an open data portal. This is a great step in the right direction, but unfortunately, there's no public transport data available. Certainly nothing as useful as real-time information. So it's my hope that possibly together, we can help liberate this data and make it truly useful for everyone. So if there's anybody here who is in the city or knows someone, please chat to me afterwards. Thank you. We have a few t-shirts and goodies to give away. So if there are any decent questions, you might get lucky.
Also, if you come to us after the talk, if you don't get a t-shirt, and show us the app installed on your device, you'll get one of these awesome stickers. If it's the latest version with cloud integration, you'll get one of these too. Hi. Um, I just wanted to find out um, with the platform, are you not, did you feel that you had any constraints in terms of what you could um, deploy to the Google App Engine? Um, it's been a while since I've looked at it. Um, things like, like Spring, latest versions and things like that, are there any constraints? So being a platform as a service, there are certain rules by which one has to abide. Uh, one example that, strike, that comes out to me is that uh, there's certain libraries that you wouldn't be able to use on App Engine because it violates certain of the platform's rules, such as writing to the local file system. Um, in many cases, a lot of these libraries can be adjusted to work on App Engine. Um, but with the recent addition of managed VMs, uh, that, that makes this whole story a lot simpler. So if there's something you can't run, run due to the platform constraints, you can run it in a Compute Engine VM and have App Engine manage that for you. This is because they've sort of been bridging the gap between infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. And so this is the one thing that came out of there, which is you can consider for things you can't do with the platform. A cloud t-shirt for a cloud question. Hi guys, I was just wondering um, what uh, in Google App Engine and Prince is there to protect you or limit your liability from becoming a victim of your own success? You know, given that there's costs involved for all the services that are running, you know, if your, if your predictions are slightly out, what, um, what can you do to protect yourself from having a credit card bill that's ex extraordinary? Cool, that's a good question. So when you do enable billing when you get past the, free, the daily free quota, you're allowed to set a uh, daily budget in terms of how many dollars the app is allowed to go to before it stops. Uh, this saves you from running, spiraling out of control in terms of costs, but uh, yeah. Uh, there is a big difference between the free quota and what you get as soon as you do enable billing. And Google does this just to sort of validate that you are willing to pay for the app and, and the, the amount of quota that goes from free to what you get when you just enable billing is magnitudes uh, higher. So you're pretty safeguarded in that sense as well. So uh, you mentioned uh, when you were singing the praises of the, the data store that you had uh, constant query times uh, no matter how much your data grew. Given that, I don't quite understand what benefit memcache gave you. So one of the API quota limits that you get is the read and write operations on the data store. And uh, what, what we did is using app stats, we, we saw a call that was reading from the data store and putting memcache in place instead saved us from doing those reads. Okay, so, so it was a read limitation, not a, not a speed up or, or something? Uh, yes, it, it was a speed improvement in terms of reading off of memcache is quicker on the platform than reading off of the data store. Okay. Uh, but it was also a, a, a cost saving in terms of the quota for the data store. Hi, um, I have a couple of questions actually. The first one is using the cloud endpoints, doesn't that by itself lock you into the app engine? Uh, the second question is, can you use the GCM from outside the app engine, like in any other cloud platform? So on the first question, um, the libraries generated by the platform to use on the client side is not something you're forced to use. Uh, it's a RESTful service and uh, it's well documented. So if you were to, um, if you wanted to write your own methods to access the APIs, you could. The libraries are just a convenience thing that's generated by the platform. Um, on the platform side, exposing the API using uh, just the annotations, I think is a platform side thing. Um, but yeah, it would be something you'd need to, to implement yourself if you were working off of the platform. 
And in terms of using GCM from outside of the cloud platform, that certainly is possible. It's very easy to use. It's an HTTP or XMPP protocol that you can use. Hi there, guys. Quick question. Um, I was just wondering, um, as a free service thing, would there be any plans to, how would you support this in the long term when your users may be running into the threshold of you actually having to involve any cost in it? Um, is there any sponsors? Does, since you're not officially affiliated with my city, then I guess, how would, how would, what would happen if you were to reach that threshold and somebody has to start paying for this? Is that an offer to sponsor? No, not at all, but <laughs> it's a it, very, it, it it's begs a the question because every startup wants to eventually start small and grow big and without funding and you still stay your, your, your own developers and you've got no real funding yet for it, it is interesting to know what would you be if you're going to reach that threshold then. Yeah, it's a very good question. It's something I have sleepless nights about. So we implemented a fail-safe where if we turned off the cloud, the app would still function flawlessly except it wouldn't receive new alerts. So that's a fail-safe, but we're now considering possibilities of working with the people that have the information available. Potentially, we could leverage APIs that they provide or something like that. So to answer your questions, we do not know, but we hope to find out. We can maybe do one more. Uh, are there any plans to go cross-platform onto iOS or Windows Phone? And then how easily does the Google App Engine support that cross-platform change? Sort of, kind of, maybe. <laughs> I have a few iOS app dev friends, and they keep saying they want to build an iOS version. I say, sure, go for it. On the note of whether the cloud side will support it, Endpoints generates libraries for iOS, so that whoever would be going for it would easily be able to import this library and use it uh, to make API requests. And Apple has a similar infrastructure to GCM, where we could send out the real-time alerts over there.